My name is Anna Mitchell. Today's date is February 22nd, 2018, and I'm interviewing Asma Barani on the Ball State campus as part of the Virginia B. Ball Center seminar, Muslims and Muncie. Asma, thank you for sharing your story with us today. Thank you for having me. So I want to begin by asking, when and where were you born? Um, I was actually born in Ball Memorial Hospital, so right near here, and I ha was born in Muncie, so I've, and I've lived here my entire life. And what year were you born? Uh, born in 1994. Right, and then um, tell me a little bit about your parents. Uh, so my parents are originally from Afghanistan, and um, they came to the U.S. over 30 years ago um, because they had to uh, flee Afghanistan because it was unsafe during the Soviet invasion. And so they came as refugees over 30 years ago, and they have settled in Muncie, and we've been here ever since. And what, what are their names? Uh, my dad's name is Saber, and my mom's name is Bibi. Right, and then do you have any siblings? I have five siblings. Um, we were all actually born at Ball Memorial Hospital in Muncie. Um, I have an oldest brother named Yusuf, an, another brother named Hamid, and then an older sister named Samaya. And then I have two younger siblings, Lena and Zaki. So there's a lot of us. And then what was it like growing up in Muncie in the 90s and early 2000s? Um, for the most part, we had a very peaceful life. Um, you know, small community, but a very kind and peaceful community. Um, a lot of the times, we, especially because we went to Yorktown community schools, um, we were the only, a lot of times we were the only Muslims that people had met or interacted with. Um, and so that could pose challenges, but it was also just an interesting experience just because, you know, people are usually very curious to learn and sometimes you were aware of that you were different. But um, for the most part, people were very nice and we've always enjoyed living here, which is why we've stayed for so long. Do you feel as if then the, so your family is Muslim? Yes. And then the religious community outside of that was more predominantly Christian? Yeah, for the most part, um, most of the people I knew and most of my friends were Christian. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of similarities between Islam and Christianity. So uh, a lot of my friends actually ended up being very strong Christians because we had a lot of the same values. Um, so. Even though there was differences, I think we always tried to focus on the similarities. And then, um, growing up, how do you remember um, how you learned about the Quran? Yeah, so um, since I was little, probably about five or six, I've been going to Sunday school. Um, so that was um, kind of my parents' way and our community's way of making sure that you know we stay close to our faith, since it's very hard to do that in the public school system and. Um, when most of your friends don't practice the same faith. So we've always been to Sunday school, and in Sunday school, we usually had one class over the Quran. But in addition to that, my dad, um, both of my parents, but my dad especially, always made an, ex an extra effort to teach us at home in addition to what we were getting in Sunday school. And um, so that's how we always stayed close to, our, to the Quran and our faith, because our parents really emphasized it, and uh, we went to school. So. How did Islam shape your family practices at home? Um, that is kind of a loaded question because it kind of shapes everything that we do. Um, so a lot of the values, which are values that, I mean, I think most people adopt and, you know, just being honest, kind, giving people. But then in addition to that, um, we obviously incorporated many other aspects of the religion. So we have to pray five times a day. And so my parents especially emphasized making sure we did those prayers together because you can do them alone, but um, there's much more unity and uh, it brings the family together if you pray together. I think there's even like a saying about that. So we always prayed five prayers together. And so that would mean we interrupted whatever we were doing and we would get together and you know pray to God together. And then um, that would be kind of our own, our family time and a time to get close to God. And, and other than that, I mean, just like some nights we just would spend like talking about the Quran together and learning if, like because going to Sunday school once a week for a couple hours, maybe we weren't always getting enough out of that. So uh, we spent a lot of time learning about our religion and I think it influenced almost the way we did everything. So. so would you say that Islam was perhaps a key to your family's identity? Definitely. Um, so my parents are from Afghanistan, but they've always emphasized that we are Muslim, our Muslim identity comes first, and then we're also Afghan and we're also American. But uh, the faith was always at the core, 
because the faith is what shapes you into what kind of person you're going to be. And so they always focus having good character and um, good ethics, be hardworking, because those are all parts of our faith and just parts of being a good person. So I think that was always at the center. You talked about some characteristics that you know make a good Muslim, um, but was there any other important lessons that you felt were imparted by your family about being a Muslim? Um, well, so one of the things was that um, just about being proud of our identity and, um, you know, being a Muslim is working on yourself, but it's also about educating others and, you know, learning more about others and also teaching them about yourself because that creates more understanding and um, obviously more unity and more friendship. So they would always emphasize that, you know, we should always, you know, be strong and uh, confident in our faith and our practices um, and teach that even to our friends. Like, I mean, not forcing it on anyone, but just so that we can, you know, people can learn from each other and get more understanding. Like, for example, we don't eat pork. So at school when they would serve certain hot dogs or other pork sandwiches, so like we would have to get a substitute meal. And then, you know, even just from that, I mean, you, I, feel, I felt different myself, but then it's also an opportunity to teach others, which maybe you don't realize the value in that when you're young, but as we got older, we definitely realized that, so. When you were young, did you ever feel, feel any um, self-awareness of any kind of discrimination that you faced based on your ethnicity or your religion? Um, so when I was young, I don't remember specifically. I do remember that I looked, you know, different to an extent, and some people would ask me, like, where I'm from. Um, nothing that really bothered me, except for a couple times uh, when I wore traditional, my traditional Afghan clothes to school, and um, I think that happened twice, and both times I got teased a little bit. Like, my friends were very supportive, but just by other people, I got teased, and so I was like, I'm not going to wear these again to school. I remember telling my mom that. But other than that, I've always had pretty good experiences. I want to move a little now onto some of your education. Okay. Um, you spoke a little bit about uh, having Sunday school. Mm -hmm. Now, was that at the mosque over on Ball Avenue? Yes, it was. Could you tell me a little bit more about your experience there? Yeah, so um, most of my childhood memories of being in a mosque are at that, are at that mosque. And um, so, it was very small, but very kind of a cozy place. We were, especially we were a smaller community then. And so it was a perfect size for us. And um, that's where we had all of our Sunday school, our monthly dinners, which was just a community gathering and um, all of our festivities for Eid, the holidays. And so uh, I have a lot of great memories there. Uh, some things I remember specifically about it was just that the rooms were very open and square and it kind of forced everyone to have to sit together, which was a good thing because we were all really close um, and everyone got to know each other very well. And so I have a lot of fond memories of it. Then um, for Sunday school, do you remember anything in particular that really prepared you for your life as a Muslim? Um, I think it just, it kind of gives you, um, there's kind of two, two things. So we focus on the Quran and then we also focus on um, the history of Islam and just, you know, all the struggles that different prophets went through. And so I think part of that, like, put things in perspective for me, you know, how, how many trials they went through and how my trials are pretty insignificant compared to that, but how even if I do have those trials, I can overcome them. So in one sense, having those examples and stories gave, were an inspiration to me. And then in the, another sense, we also just learned about, you know, how to practice, how, what's the, um, how should you be praying and what methods and stuff like that. And so I think just some of those basic skills are, it's not always easy for parents to teach you all of those things. So I think it was just valuable to have, um, to learn about the proper etiquettes of different practices. So moving now to your high school experience, um, where did you go to high school? I went to Yorktown High School. And when did you begin your schooling there? Um, when did I begin? I don't remember the exact year. I was probably 2009. I guess, yeah, 2009. And that's the same year I started wearing the hijab too, so that was a big year. Yeah, did that ever make you feel singled out amongst your peers? Um, when I first started, um, I, I mean, obviously walking into a, a building, being the only person wearing hijab, and it was like, I, I myself felt like overwhelmed and maybe self-conscious. I don't know if necessarily everyone was reacting that as much as I thought they were. 
but it definitely was uh, difficult for the first time to walk in, um, especially because uh, I had grown up. I had grown up with all those people, so in one sense it was good because they already knew me, so I was less likely to maybe be teased about it. But in another sense, they're going to be like, "Why'd you start now?" Like, you know, there's going to be a lot of questions. So it was kind of nerve-wracking to walk in for the first time. Um, but I always had like a lot of. I told my friends ahead of time, and they were very supportive and helped me through that. So. so sometimes wearing the hijab can make you stand out as like almost a spokesperson for Islam. Did you feel like that in high school ever? So when I first started wearing it, it was mainly just kind of getting over the hurdle the self-consciousness but I think like probably into my junior and senior year as I started getting more involved um, and I ended up being you know one of the most involved people in my school and an athlete and so many different aspects and then that's when I started realizing that you know uh, I mean this comes with a lot of kind of power but responsibility too because I'm the only Muslim people are meeting, and what the example that I set is the example people are going to think of when they think of Muslims, I mean, hopefully. And so it kind of started hitting on me as I got into my junior and senior year and I got more involved. But I also was kind of proud of it too because, you know, I felt that like I was a good example, so I was, I mean, I thought it, it was a responsibility, but um, I didn't necessarily mind having to live up to it. So. And moving on to your college education, where did you end up going for college? Uh, I went to Purdue University. What did you study there? I majored in pharmaceutical sciences. And then you spent your whole life in a specific Muslim community here in Muncie, um, and then you left for college. Um, were there any difficulties during that period of transition in finding a kind of a faith community at Purdue? Yeah, so... Um... I knew from the get-go before going to college that uh, I wanted to join the Muslim Student Association, which are, you know, in most colleges they have. And so because I wanted to stay, um, keep a connection to my faith, but also find, you know, the Muslim friends that I didn't really have growing up. And so that was kind of the first thing, like, I was looked up on Facebook, you know, how am I going to join? So. Uh, I think from the, from the beginning, I was like, I want to make sure I had that sense of belonging and find those connections right away so I could stay close to my faith. And then were there any other groups that you joined in college? Yeah, so I was part of a, quite a few different things. Um, one of them was Students for Justice in Palestine. Um, I did a lot of social justice work and um, also involved in uh, Riley fundraising. So uh, I was very busy. Most of the time, though, I probably would say was spent on Muslim Student Association because after my first semester, I joined the board and I was on the board for three years. So we did a lot of event planning and it was a lot of fun, but it was also a lot of work, which was good. Were there any events that you were especially proud of? Yeah, so um, we held an Islamic Awareness Week, which I know they've had here at Ball State, too. And that's for me, that's like one of the main reasons I joined Muslim Student Association, which I said was to make stay close to my faith, but also have an opportunity to share that with others and educate others, especially during a time um, where there was so many so much discrimination and propaganda. And so having Islamic Awareness Week and having an open tent in the middle of the lawn on Purdue's campus and having people just come up and ask questions, I thought like it was one of the the most rewarding events to be a part of because people want to learn and it was just great. I got to meet so many new people and answer their questions, and a lot of misconceptions were cleared up, I think, through that week of events. And then, um, do you attend school now? Yeah, so now I am a student at the IU School of Medicine in the Muncie campus, so I'm back in Muncie. <laughs> so then you're going for your master's degree? Um, it's a professional degree uh, to be a medical doctor. Yeah, I know your father is a doctor. Are you, in some ways, kind of do you feel like you're making him proud by following in his footsteps? Oh, I think so, definitely. Um, he definitely didn't pressure me into it, but I think uh, growing up, watching his example and how hardworking he was, but how much he impacted his patients, um, I like even if he he was trying to encourage me to you know explore other options, but. At the end of the day, that's what I grew up with and that's what I saw and how much of an impact he had on people. And that's the same impact that I wanted to have. So I think 
um, whether he realized it or not, he was my driving factor for it, you know, pursuing medicine. And so I think he's, I mean, I think he's very proud of it too. Um, and so far it's going well, so. <laughs> I want to move now and talk a little bit about the Muslim community here in Muncie. Um, so from a young age, how did you meet other Muslims? Um, so primarily it was through the mosque. Uh, there, there weren't a lot of Muslims my age, but there were a few and, you know, some of them went to other schools. But other than the mosque, I really didn't have many other um, ways to meet Muslims. My parents had friends kind of all over the country, so in that way, you know, I had some family friends that were Muslims, but um, for the most part, and I, it's not necessarily that I realized I was like lacking in something. I was like perfectly content, you know, having a few friends at the mosque, but then also my Christian friends were my, my closest friends who I went to school with. But I think part of not having very many Muslim friends was what made me so eager to join the Muslim Student Association at Purdue, just to get a different experience um, and make those connections that I really hadn't had before. And then how were you involved with the Islam Center before you went off to college? So um, as I got older, I think in my junior and senior year of high school, um, because the course, the, the course levels kind of end before that, I decided to start volunteer teaching and um, for like the young, for the youngest class. And so the reason I wanted to do that is because first of all, I love teaching, but I also wanted to give back to, you know, a system or a, a program that had given me so much. So I started teaching and I, and I loved it, but obviously when I went to Purdue, I couldn't do it anymore. But I actually ended up doing some volunteer teaching at Purdue too. But also before I went, um, one thing that our community lacked because we didn't have many Muslims was, you know, other, programs for kids outside of Sunday school. And so my sister and I um, decided to uh, establish kind of a overnight camp at the mosque. Um, for the kids, we arranged a lot of activities. It was during the summer, so like tie-dyeing t-shirts and just, and then we made board games out of Islamic trivia. And we just wanted to have a fun experience for the kids outside of just school so they could have like positive associations with the mosque and feel more connected to the mosque and their faith, but also to their Muslim friends. And so that was something that was really fun that we did. And how do you involve yourself with the Islamic Center now? Um, so now uh, my mom is actually the uh, president of the Islamic Center. And even before she was president, I've always just volunteered for the different events that we've had. But now, especially um, for the monthly dinners and other events, um, I try to help in any way I can, whether that's setting up or cleaning up. Um, or anything like that. And I'm also uh, back, to, back to volunteer teaching at the mosque. I started kind of a, a teenager group. It's more of a discussion than a class, but it's just one hour a week for some of the older kids who um, may not be able to ask their parents the questions that they want to ask. And so they can talk to someone who's hopefully more approachable, um, me. And so I usually have that one hour discussion or kind of class with them once a week. So that's what I do now. So how do you remember the community um, practicing uh, the Friday prayer? Um, so Friday prayer, um, it's kind of always been the same. It's always been, on, I mean, obviously on Friday. And there's always been a 20, 20 to 30 minute um, khutbah or like a lecture um, sermon. Sermon is a best, better word. But it's always been like that. But we've never had a hired imam. So like most mosques that are, you know, with larger communities or um, have more finances are able to hire someone to professionally be their imam, which will lead the prayers and give the Friday um, sermons. But since we never had that, we always just had a rotating volunteer schedule. And so that's just something that I was accustomed to. I, I didn't even realize that other mosques paid people to do it. But um, so besides, that's besides the point, but my dad was always in that rotation. So I remember the few times that I got to go, because obviously it's during school, but I did get to go a few times. And I remember like listening to my dad give the talk. And um, it was just nice because you all like listen to nice reminders together of uh, whatever the person decided to talk about. But then you also get to pray together right afterwards where you stand right next to each other. And so I think it's just a nice community gathering, but it's also short and sweet because obviously People are busy on Fridays, a work day, but um, I always remember that we always made an effort to still 
to still keep it going. And we've always had pretty decent attendance, so. And then how did the community practice Ramadan? Um, so Ramadan, um, so we normally have monthly dinners, which is just once a, once a month uh, potluck dinner. But during Ramadan, um, it's a time to get closer to your faith, but also to your Muslim community. And we're all going through the same things together. So we end up having a dinner every Saturday, so once a week. And uh, so that just brings the community to cut together during, you know, it's a time of working on our faith, but it's also just a time to work on our community. So we always did that. And then in addition to that, we have a volunteer schedule to, um, for people to bring in food for the students. Because sometimes there's always Ball State students who are staying in Muncie over the summer, maybe they're taking classes and they don't necessarily have a family or anyone to cook for them. So every day someone is volunteering to bring food to the mosque for those students. And then on Saturdays, it's when everyone goes to the mosque and eats. But um, so I think it's just because it's such a time of giving, that's one of the main focuses of Ramadan. Um, there's always a lot more giving and charity. And I always just remember that um, people are always trying to feed each other during Ramadan. So like, you're supposed to break your fast at the same time, but I always remember people trying to give me something before they would give themselves and vice versa. And that ends up being, sometimes it can be to the point where no one ends up eating, <laughs> but just, just because it's a time of giving and um, putting others before yourself. So it's, it was always really nice. I know you have um, a big community or a, a, a very diverse community. How did um, you as a community decide to end, like when to end Ramadan? Okay, so um, I think in the past, it's probably changed, but in the past, we have always just gone um, according to another mosque. Actually, even now, I think we may have just switched the mosque because traditionally how it's supposed to be done is someone is supposed to look at the moon and see like whether the month is ending. And I don't know the specifics of it, but we don't really have any like professional moon watching people here. So we usually rely on another community who did that and then just go with whatever they did. And that was just kind of based on a majority decision. And um, like people had a discussion and were like, okay, we're gonna go with this mosque every time. And because one thing, um, even though some people disagree, one thing that's really important in Islam is to have unity. So we wanted to do what most people were doing. Like, you know, you don't want Muslims all over the country celebrating on a different day. And because some of those things can just get really technical. But one of the things is like, we want to do what the majority is doing because it's nice to have unity. And um, some of the times the little details don't matter as much. So that's one, one of the reasons why we decided to do that. Now, the mosque here in Muncie has um, many different diverse races and ethnicities and sects. What is your relationship with some Muslims that are very different from yourself? Um, that's actually something I really loved. Um, I grew up with people from Bangladesh and um, African-American background, so many different countries. And because we are a small community, it's not like even if we wanted to, we could divide based on different ethnicities. Like I was always, we were always so integrated and together that I didn't even realize until I grew up that other communities really segregate. I mean, you'll have, if it's a large enough city, you'll have a mosque that's primarily just Arabs, a mosque that's primarily people from Pakistan and India. And, and those kind of things, and it just naturally kind of people divide. But because we were a small, small community, we didn't have that chance, nor did we want it, because we, we were a small community, we were all so close to each other. So um, I was always interacting with people of different backgrounds, and people practice Islam in so many different ways, and their cultures are so uniquely different. So I think that having that perspective um, really helped me see the world better. If I had just grown up with people that were just like me, and just the way that I practice Islam, like I feel like I wouldn't be as a well-rounded of a person and I wouldn't have such a open perspective, so. Then how have Muslim residents come together to form a single community, would you say? Like what's kind of the, the bond, the tie, you know? Like yeah. Ties the bond. <laughs> um, I think it's just the sense that, you know, Muslims want to meet, meet other Muslims because like we, we have to pray five times a day and um, it's nice to be able to do that with other people. And so I think that anywhere people go, whether there's a mosque or not, you try to meet other Muslims because uh, it's easy to connect with them. They can teach you, even if like, let's say I'm moving to a new community and I don't really know anyone, I'm gonna look for whether there's a Muslim population or a mosque because 
first of all, it's going to be a form of bel uh, a belonging, but also they can help me find resources for like halal meat or, um, you know, other things like, okay, what should I do in this situation and that situation and this town? And because there's, some, there's a lot of different things that kind of have to regulate the way we live our lives. So a lot of times it's for a sense of belonging, but also just to help one another and to seek help. So I think that naturally, whether there's a mosque or not, Muslims tend to just find each other and kind of um, connect. And not, not in the sense that they're not gonna be friends with other people, but just because it's nice to have people that understand where you're coming from and can help you. And now um, you have some members here at the mosque that um, were former members of the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. um, have you been aware of kind of the historic African-American Muslim presence in the U.S.? Um, I am aware of it. I don't know if I'm very knowledgeable about it, but I know that Islam was in the U.S. much before people realize. You know, people think that, you know, we just all came over and brought it, but it's been here even since the time of slavery, really, because a lot of those people were Muslim. And so Islam has been here so much longer than people realize. And there's so many different ways to practice Islam. And there's so many different people that practice Islam. And it's something that, you know, I'm aware of to an extent, but I think everyone needs to be aware of is that, you know, we don't just fit one mold. We're 1.5 billion people, you know, from so many different places. So um, I think it's always great to have different perspectives. And that's something that we had in Muncie because um, of the African-American population. And then what would you say is the greatest strength of the religious community here? I, I think that I've seen more unity here than I have in other communities, um, whether that's because it's a small community, whether that's because uh, we have really good leaders. But I think that we're really good at kind of overcoming those small differences and focusing on what can bring us together rather than fo focusing on little details. And I didn't, and again, I didn't realize that until I went to other communities and I kind of was like, oh, there's so much division here. Like, and, you know, my friends would be like, oh, that's normal. And I was like, oh, not, not at my mosque. Or like, I mean, maybe I didn't realize, but no, I think our community is very unified. I think we've had kind of a core set of families and people that started the mosque and stayed with it and that kept it stable and also um, made sure that we were always focused on the same mission and that we always were being as inclusive as possible. Now, you say that there is a really great um, aspect of unity here at the mosque, but um, have you ever ex experienced obstacles that the community has faced? Yeah, so there, there have been some obstacles. Um, sometimes people may disagree with certain things, and if I try to come up with an example, I'm not sure if I'll be able to. Uh, but usually if someone does object, and like I said, there's so many different ways to practice Islam, but also culture, people's different cultures can influence that they, the way they want to practice Islam, which um, it's always good to keep culture and faith separate because they're separate things. But in those cases, um, usually the mosque will just go with the majority. So I'm not saying that it's always going to be a unanimously agreeing decision, but we do tend to go with the majority. Um, and that's the way we kind of get through most of those issues. And now, I know some members um, are professors here at the university um, and that at times they might move um, out of Muncie mm -hmm. and then attend perhaps a different mosque. Is that kind of shifting population, can that be hard sometimes for the mosque to like stay together? Yeah, so a lot of, um, so a lot of the families that have kind of been with it from the beginning, um, just recently, like they stayed with it for a long time, but some of them have moved to like Indianapolis or other bigger areas. And I mean, I wouldn't, it kind of hurt the community a little bit because um, the unity was like, they were part of that core. And so it kind of, it kind of, it, we had to adjust. Um, but you know, that's always gonna happen. Families leave, new families come in. And I think we found a new balance after a lot of maybe those people left. Also people are getting older, so they can't be as involved. So. You, it's good to get new families and fresh faces into the mix. And um, I mean, I wouldn't say it significantly changed anything, but we definitely had to adjust and we found a new balance. So I want to now talk a little bit more about um, the old mosque on Ball Avenue. Now that served the Muslim community for many years before they moved. Mm -hmm. um, how could you describe um, that mosque just a bit more? Um, in what sense? Just like how it looked or how it was? Um, just perhaps like the community atmosphere. Yeah. Um, so one thing 
uh, like I like I think like I said, so I think our community was smaller then, and um, I I think part of it's even just you know how the mosque was arranged with the larger rooms that were more conducive to everyone kind of sitting together. Um, so I always felt like a little bit more unity in those senses, um, but I think that was just because we had a con more of a consistent population, which is not necessarily, I mean, it's a good thing, but it's not necessarily a bad thing to not have that. So I feel like now with the bigger mosque, which was needed because our population was growing, especially with a lot of Ball State students, but we're also having a lot of shifts and changes in our population. So it's not as consistent, um, but, it's still good in a different way because now, you know, sometimes when I go to the mosque, I'm meeting people I've never met before, which when I, I felt like at the old mosque, that didn't really happen much. Um, but it's part of just because, probably because of Ball State and other factors. But so I think there are some changes, but um, both both are good situations. They're just different. And so now within that smaller, more concise community. Um, do you remember who attended Friday prayer or like the relationships between the immigrant and the African-American members? Um, to be honest, because we always had school, I probably only went a few times to Friday prayer. So um, I don't really remember much, but uh, I mean, I would say that because actually Friday prayer is obligatory for men. Um, so no matter what, you're always gonna have that diverse population. But I can't really speak much to that because I wasn't usually there when they're at the old mosque. So, so then, what activities um, would you say were most central to the masjid's role then? Um, do you mean like community activities or within itself? Um, either, if you have any. Either. Uh, again, I usually just remember the monthly dinners, but um, I think we've always done outreach. To especially, um, you know, the African American population would would help us with a lot of that outreach. But I, I think that now we're definitely doing more. So that's something that we're we we've, we've been learning over time, and I think it's progressed to the point. And I think we're doing more now. But we've always it's always been a part of our mission um, to, you know, make sure our own community is educated and that we're unified, but also to interact with our outside community. So I think that's always been a part of our our community, which is really good. And then how old were you when the mosque moved to Hustler Road? Um, I feel like I was maybe 12 or 13, somewhere around there. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure, but I, was, I think I was a teenager. And what was your first impression of when you when you walked through those doors? Um, so obviously it was much, it's, it's a much nicer building and our other building was not very nice, but um, it was just new, it was different. And uh, so I was excited because I think the mosque really needed that change. Uh, but in other sense, obviously I was sad too, cause I'm like, oh, I'm gonna miss, you know, that place, the old mosque was my, my second home growing up. But um, I was definitely excited because I knew, I knew it was like a good move for the mosque and that we had finally, you know, after so much work, had fundraised enough money to make that move. Um, and I was like also excited because the Sunday school was actually gonna have like proper classrooms, which we never had before, we just kind of, arrange in different groups on the floor, which is also fun, but it's sometimes nice to have a little more structure and more space. So it was mixed feelings for sure. And so now, um, how would you describe your, your first impression then from when you were about 12 to the Islamic Center now? Um, I would say that now, I mean, now I really can't imagine going back to a different space just because I feel like we're so active now and, um, you know, that, that the type of structure that we have is really needed for all the events that we do for the Sunday school and for the monthly dinners and um, you know when we do have when we do need a lot of visitors coming to the mosque we have the space for them we can accommodate them properly and I think that's like very essential to um, being able to hold so many programs and events so I think it's really important and I really couldn't imagine that we could have done that in, in the old mosque. So it was definitely a needed change. And now that I've gotten older, I'm not as like, oh, well, I like my, I like the old place. It's more just like, oh, this is a more sensible and better option. And now I have good memories associated with this one too, because it's been a while now, so. So then how has it evolved in any way since um, going off to college and then coming back? Um, I would say that, you know, some of the things that have changed um, 
Where, I mean, obviously the community has changed a little bit. So I remember I came back and I was like, people were asking me who I was. And I'm like, wait, I'm normally the one asking people who they are because I'm the one that's always here. But that was like an adjustment. I was like, oh wait, I've been gone at Purdue. So um, I th that was just kind of funny to me. But um, one of the changes is that like, I think our Sunday school is like more structured now, which is good. I mean, before we always had it, but it wasn't very structured and uh, which was fun, but it's it was kind of nice to have that change. And there's a lot more, um, there's more younger families and couples that are more involved in the moth, which is good. You think you need a balance of kind of an older perspective and a younger perspective, whereas, whereas before that may not have been as much of the case. So I think um, it's really good that younger people are stepping up and getting more involved that we can get a variety of perspective. So those are some of the changes I've noticed. So you've spoken a bit about how, you know, when you're young, you don't necessarily always have an awareness of, you know, what the adults are doing. Yeah. <laughs> um, or some of those bigger um, leadership, you know, things that are happening. Um, but now as an adult, um, do you have perhaps a greater understanding of how disagreements are resolved? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously when you're young, you don't even realize that there, there are disagreements, of course. But um, so, yeah, I've definitely... Um, you know, come to understand that, you know, there are, people do disagree even over really small things, but, you know, it's always good to just discuss it and then um, come to majority decision and, and move on. And so, and that's worked for the most part, so. Now, Asma, we've talked a little bit about um, your mother being president mm -hmm. of the Islamic Center. Um, she's the first woman to hold, first woman to hold this position. Um, what does that mean to you? Um, I think it's amazing uh, because uh, first of all, um, you don't hear many like women in leadership and in, in mosques, um, even though like there's nothing Islamically against that, but just because of maybe m more cultural reasons. And so the fact that she, you know, she broke that glass ceiling in, in our community, I think is, is great. And um, we like, we knew she was the perfect person for the job. So of course we encouraged her to do that. And so I just think that, um, it means a lot, and one of the things she always says is that she did it because she wants to kind of break that barrier so that future um, girls can also do, have this position. Not that they couldn't, but you know, once the precedent has been set, it's much easier to keep going with it. And um, so I'm just really excited about it. Now this just happened in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, what is that election process like at the Islamic Center? Um, so usually there are nominations. Um, and uh, so those anyone can nominate someone. And then once the nominees um, are selected, there is usually, we usually just turn one of the monthly dinners into like an election night and we're like, you need to be there because you need to vote. And so um, we, it was pretty casual, but then we had, the, we had the dinner and then we had the official voting. And um, actually, I think my, my mom was the only person to run in this case, but, um, Usually we don't have very many challengers, but I mean, still, obviously, the majority voted for her. And so, uh, but that's usually how it goes. Now, um, we've talked a little bit about how this is somewhat monumental for her being the first woman. Um, would you say that this is a sign of change within the community or perhaps continuity um, in terms of practices and values there? Um, in a lot of ways, it's, it's continuity. I mean, it is change in a sense, but... We've always um, had women in leadership, um, maybe a lot more so than in other mosques that um, I know of. Like, for example, my mom has been involved from the beginning, what, despite which position she has, she was always extremely involved in the mosque, and we've always had other um, females in, involved too. But um, So in, in a sense, it is continuity, because a lot of things she was doing, she had already been doing. But it's a little bit of change, because it's a, it is the first time of being president, and that, you know, that carries some weight. So um, I would definitely say that it's not, I wouldn't say it's a drastic change, but it definitely is um, significant because just that the title is kind of, um, it, because of the weight it carries, I think it maybe it means more, um, uh, if, if people know that there's a female president of the mosque, um, it can empower other girls and stuff more than just, you know, another leader. So even if you're doing the same amount of work, sometimes that means more to other people. So. Now your father, he also served as president of the Islamic mm -hmm. Center for many years. Yeah. Um, do you know of any conversations that your mother and father had together about her choice to 
become president recently? Yeah, so uh, it was kind of funny when we were talking about it because my dad had been president for so long, but when he was president, I mean, it was my mom and him working together. And so he's like, so he, he was joking. He's like, you practically did my job anyway, so you might as well be uh, just messing with her. But I think that just goes to show that um, it's always like a group effort. And with my parents, they work together. And so it was kind of a natural next step for them because my mom had been so involved. So she was the most prepared to take on this role too. And so um, obviously there was a lot of encouragement from everyone. Your parents, they obviously aren't necessarily afraid of taking on leadership roles. Do you think that has been something that has affected your own kind of value, valuing leadership? Uh, definitely, yeah, because I feel like wherever my parents um, see a gap or a need, they will fill it and, you know, whether that's taking charge of a situation. And that's something that they've always instilled in me. And uh, whether, I, not even consciously, but I kind of just always get, get into situations and whether I naturally kind of end up leading or uh, there's an, you know, it's like, oh, well, we need someone to be the president. And I'm like, okay, like, so I just naturally, I was a step into it because I kind of have grown up with this sense of um, leadership and just more of, not necessarily just like overpowering anything, but just filling a need and filling the gap. And so that's um, something that's definitely been instilled in me. And I've, from them, I've learned a lot of things about leadership because how they lead um, and how they, like my, with my mom, like she's the president, but she's also president of her own nonprofit. And during those meetings, you know, she still values every single person's opinion equally. And, you know, at the end of the day, her vote is worth just one and so is everyone else's. So, you know, they, they do lead, but it's more in a way to empower others. And I think that is the key. Um, it's not about your own power, it's about empowering others and, uh, you know, getting everyone to work towards a common goal. And so, because I've seen the way they've done it, I hopefully am incorporating the same kind of values and uh, methods of leadership in my own life. And you mentioned your mom's uh, nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, I, like I said, my family's from Afghanistan and uh, my parents um, escaped Afghanistan during you know the difficult time, the Soviet invasion, but there was a lot of people left behind and a lot of destruction, including a lot of my own extended family. So my parents, um, Primarily, my mom started up a nonprofit organization called Awaken, and uh, we've built a school and a medical clinic and uh, vocational centers for women there. So to help out, to leave, because um, my my mom would always say, you know, you know, I got to come to America and have all the opportunities, but there's so many women just like me who didn't have the opportunity, and so that's what they started, and we've been working on it ever since. Have you had um, a specific role within that? Nonprofit group? Yeah, so I've always volunteered and I always uh, help my mom with the, more of the technological stuff. And um, by the time I was like 17, I think in the bylaws you have to be 17 to be on the board of Awaken, um, which a lot of her friends are on the board. And and so they're like, Osma, you've been doing so much work, just join the board. And I was like, I'm only 17. And they're like, well, you only have to be 17. Or 17 is actually the minimum or what the requirement. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll join the board. So I've been on the board ever since. So I've always been very involved. And one of those reasons is because you know of our faith and how our faith teaches us to serve others before ourselves. So even though I've been extremely busy at Purdue and coming back and forth, I've always made an effort to be a part of it. So, so now we've talked a lot about um, the Muncie Islamic community and the mosque here, um, but have you, or the Islamic Center here, have you been influenced at all by other Muslim organizations such as ISNA? Yes. Yeah, so, um, that's actually, we, we follow um, it's in a lot of senses because they are the, um, the kind of Islamic Muslim spokesperson in the, in the whole United States. And uh, they obviously have a lot of experts and scholars um, who, fact, who go into a lot of their decisions. So we usually follow their example or role, whatever they're doing. And in one sense that we do that, for example, is that... Um, so we pray five times a day, and that's like based on where the sun is. And they've actually calculated all of those times, so that you know you don't have to look at the sun and try to figure it out on your own. And so, like for example, one of our one of the things we use is Isna gives out a prayer time schedule, and so we use one of the, the, theirs for that. And then like the Isna themselves decides when they're going to decide Eid is going to be our holiday, and so we usually go with their decision. So 
Uh, I think that's another important thing is that when you don't know, you seek knowledge, you seek someone with more knowledge than you. And so we've been a small community, so we don't always have experts or scholars within our community. So when we need a resource, we can go to ISNA, which is uh, great to be able to do that. And then do you, have you ever attended ISNA um, on your own, just uh, perhaps to go to prayer or for other events? Uh, the ISNA Mosque in Indianapolis? Um, well, the, uh, in Plainfield. In Plainfield, right, sorry. And um, I've actually only been there once, and uh, it was actually for a friend's engagement. Um, it's a beautiful mosque. I think one of the reasons we, we didn't go more is just because it, it is pretty far away from Muncie. But um, ISNA as its institution holds a conference every year, and that's something I forgot to mention earlier, but my parents would always arrange a trip for us wherever it was. It was usually in Chicago or some other big city. But they held this huge, massive conference where they brought speakers from um, across America. And we always went to that every year. And so that was another way that we got to interact with other Muslims and learn more about our religion is because of those conferences that ISNA held. And then um, another big organization, kind of more in the central Indiana um, area, is the Muslim Alliance of Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any connections to that, or did the Islamic Center have any connections to that group? Group. Yeah, so uh, the Islamic Center has actually worked with um, Muslim Alliance of Indiana. Uh, we held a dinner here in Muncie where they were the co-sponsors. Um, it was actually a mayor's iftar. So we had the mayor of Muncie come, and it was during the month of Ramadan where we break our fast, and that meal is called iftar. And so um, the Muslim Alliance of Indiana was trying to get different cities around Indiana to arrange these mayor's iftars to you know, for each city to engage their own mayor and leadership into the into Ramadan and learn more about it and also into the Muslim community. And so I think they contacted the Islamic Center of Muncie and they're like, hey, we want to help you guys arrange a mayor's iftar. And so we worked together on that, which was like, I'm very happy that the Muslim Alliance of Indiana, because sometimes, um, not necessarily because we don't want to hold an event, but they just have great ideas too. And then we were able to implement that here and that was one of a really, a really successful event that we had. So now to wrap up, talking about um, a bit of the specific uh, Muncie um, Islamic institution, um, what would you say distinguishes the Islamic Center of Muncie from mosques and other places that you have visited, such as Purdue? Um, I think going back to what I said, it was just that um, I've seen a lot more unity in, in our mosque here. And where, when I've been to other mosques, um, when, like when I went to Purdue, I went to the mosque there and I never was really welcomed by anyone. And I never really felt a sense of, a, a strong sense of community there. And as I learned more about it, there was a lot of division in that community. And so um, that made me realize and appreciate, you know, our own mosque and community here so much more because I realized that, you know, not every community, um, finds it that easy to, you know, unite on, on different issues and different things. So um, I think that definitely made me appreciate the Muncie, the Muncie community a lot more. Um, moving on, I'd like to talk a little bit about your own personal practice of Islam. Um, how would you characterize your practice? Um, I would say that uh, I'm practicing Muslim. Um, I, I'm very religious and I um, I do my best to incorporate it into all aspects of my life. How would you describe your engagement with the Quran or the Hadith? Um, so I try to because I, I learned a lot through Sunday school, but obviously after that ends, you have it's a self uh, you have to independently study, and so sometimes that can be difficult just because of life and you know different circumstances and also when you get into college obviously you have a lot of other things but I've always tried to make an effort to um, either read the Quran or listen to the Quran at least once a week and also now that I'm uh, back to teaching uh, a class slash discussion like I mentioned at the Islamic Center with the teenagers um, I'm actually learning a lot through that process too because it requires me to do some research ahead of time so it's actually a benefit for me and for them which I'm really happy about. And then um, also during the month of Ramadan, the month of Ramadan is the month where the Quran was revealed to the Prophet uh, Muhammad. And so that's a month where we, I, I said we focus a lot on service, but we also focus on just 
connecting with our faith. So that's a month that I usually spend just reading the Quran, reading the translation and trying to get a better understanding of it, um, as well as learning about the Hadith. And, I, and we also focus on that a lot too. Now, we live in um, a culture that is predominantly Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I understand, might have forced you to adapt some of your practices um, as a Muslim. How, in what ways do you feel like maybe you had to adapt? Um, there's kind of just a lot of small things. Uh, one of them is just that I went playing sports because I have to cover fully. Um, you know, I had to change what I wore and I had to get like special permission uh, in order to wear certain pants during soccer so that my legs wouldn't show. Um, and uh, a lot of things like that. It's not necessarily that they've been an issue, but usually I just have to like let people know ahead of time if, if you know, it's going to be a problem. And it can make it can definitely make things more difficult because the traditional, uh, you know, jersey and shorts or whatever the uniform may be will not be conducive to you know wearing hijab. So there's definitely adjustments that need to be made. And uh, because people are not really educated, and they've never met any other Muslims, they they don't really understand it. So you have to adjust, but you also have to explain to them. I remember having to explain to my uh, teacher in high school for like 20 minutes that I couldn't swim in a bathing suit in front of guys. And because I think she just had never met another Muslim, she really did not understand. So that was kind of one difficulty that I remember. But I would say the main thing is just trying to incorporate the five prayers into my day. That's kind of the big key thing. And in high school, um, you know, a lot of times we would miss like one prayer because of classes and then we'd have to make it up when we get home. Uh, I think sometimes when we had sports after school, we would um, talk to the school and we'd have to like, hey, can we use this room to pray after so we can, so we don't miss all of our prayers. And so they, obviously they were very accommodating to that, but it does take a little extra effort. And it, I mean, obviously people, especially in high school, I was a little bit embarrassed to even ask, but we definitely did do that. And then at Purdue, um, there was there actually was a mosque on campus, but it's not always accessible depending on your, where your classes are and how much time you have in between. So I remember like certain classes I would have back to back and there'd be 10 minutes in between. I would just end up praying in some stairwell like kind of behind it where it's kind of a private area. And so you kind of just figure things out and you kind of just learn little places that you can pray. There was actually one library with a certain stairwell that was like a designated prayer spot. And so like, I remember when I used to go to pray there, there would other there'd be other Muslims coming out and we'd like wait for each other. So it, it kind of became um, a little spot. So I think that's probably the most difficult thing is kind of arranging prayers into our schedule. Um, those are the kind of the main things that I like on a daily basis that I deal with. Have there ever been any difficulties in um, making sure that you eat halal? Yeah, that's actually that's the other one that I was just thinking about. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of difficult to have halal meat um, in Muncie. We usually have to get it from somewhere else. So when I'm eating out, I usually just say I'm a eat vegetarian. So I always have to be careful about you know what I'm eating and uh, you know where it's coming from, whether or not it has any meat products in it. Um, so that's definitely something that also um, influences me. But usually I just say I'm vegetarian, and that kind of clears that up pretty easily. But uh, yeah, so since we can't really get halal meat in Muncie, we usually have to go to Indianapolis, or sometimes we even go to bigger cities like Chicago and Michigan if we're already going that way, um, so that we can kind of buy in bulk and then bring it back. And then how have you been able to implement zakat? Um, so zakat, um, which is the obligatory charity. So if you yourself are not financially independent, you do not have to give zakat. Um, especially if you are dependent on someone else. So when my, when my father pays the cut, he pays on behalf of all of us. And so as of yet, I have not, I've never given zakat in, in a technical sense because I haven't had an income. But when I do, um, it's, it will just be 2.5% of my income. But when you're, when you're not financially independent, it's not obligatory to do that. And then have you ever been on the hajj? I have not. Um, so Hajj, you have to do at least one time in your lifetime. And that's also another thing where, I mean, you can do it as many times as you want, but it's only obligatory to do it once. And that one time is only if you're financially stable and uh, healthy enough to do it. And so 
I will probably wait until I can pay for the trip on my own and do it on my own. And um, I'll probably wait till I'm older, but so far I haven't, I have not been, but I would, I would love to go. So um, there's also a smaller trip you can do called Umrah. If you don't want to do Hajj, Hajj is kind of a more extensive and longer tiring trip. There's another trip if you just want to go um, to the Kaaba called Umrah. And so um, we're talking about doing that hopefully within the next year. So I would love to see that. So is there something that you believe that your family um, brings to the Muntah community that is distinctive? Um, I would say that um, one thing about my, my, my parents and my family is that, you know, there's a lot of Muslims everywhere, but not all Muslims integrate so much into their, uh, into their community. And even if they do, they don't um, focus on educating others and still staying true to their faith. So something that I've seen my parents and I realize that not that many people do this is that, you know, they're always very um, distinctively Muslim and, you know, and they make sure people know that and educate others about it. But that doesn't stop them from being as involved in the community as anyone else. And I think because of that, um, they've been able to interact with so many more people than other than most humans do, honestly. And they've been able to bridge um, between the two communities. They've been a very strong factor in connecting both the Muslim and non-Muslim communities. And uh, honestly, I think that if that's a if they weren't here, that um, there would be a lot less of that happening. Just to be honest, so. I think that's a very important factor that they are is that bridging between the communities. What teachers or perhaps scholars of Islam um, have been important guides for you? Um, there's one uh, in particular named Omar Suleiman. Um, he's a scholar in uh, Texas actually. And so one reason, there's a couple reasons why I like him and I listen to a lot of his lectures. And one is that, um, He's grown up in the U.S. and so, you know, he kind of can relate to other Muslims that have grown up in the U.S. Uh, better than some other scholars may be able to. And he also just focuses on, you know, very like basic aspects of being a good person. Like, it's not about this verse and the history. I mean, those things are important too, but I think something that always gets lost is just like, hey, we need to be good people, we need to be advocates. He's also very strong about social justice. Social justice is like a huge part of Islam and that sometimes gets lost. And whenever, you know, we need to stand up for equality and those kind of things. And so I think that he has a more relatable um, aspect, but also I like his, like, his values and morals that he emphasizes. Is there any, um, in the same vein, is there any scholars or teachers that have been important for the Islamic community here in Muncie? Um, I don't know if there's any particular scholars that people listen to here. Um, I think we definitely incorporate like into some of our um, Islamic school classes, just different videos. If like, if we can't explain something well ourselves, we may use a video from a scholar. Um, I wouldn't say there's one in particular, but most of them tend to be ones that um, like Omar Suleiman, like I mentioned, that have grown up in the U.S. and can be more relatable. Um, to kids growing up here, so. And what would you say, um, you've talked a little bit about how you would characterize your own practice of Islam, but what would you say is the heart of Islam for you? Um, for me, the heart is really just having good character and being a good person and always putting others before myself. And and, and just, just being an honest and good person. And I think that that is the heart of Islam and a lot of other religions. And for me, that's the most important part. Like if I'm not being an honest person and if I'm not, you know, doing good for others and I, what's the point of, you know, praying? If I pray 30 times a day, that's not gonna make a difference if I'm not really being a good person. And so I think a lot of times, when I, especially when I meet people and some people are so focused on a lot of details and like, oh, you know, your dress is like this and your your hijab is showing a little bit of your hair. Like these kind of things don't matter to me. I'm like, the most important thing is, are you being a good person? Are you serving God? Are you serving the people around you? Um, are you someone that people would consider trustworthy? Are you someone that people would consider honest and hardworking? And so those are the values that I focus on the most. 
and um, I usually don't focus as much on the details. Have there ever been times where you've struggled with your faith? Um, I feel like um, in college, maybe a few times, I wouldn't say I've ever really struggled with it. Um, and since I, I've, I've seriously questioned it, and I think just that's just because my parents, um, you know, raised us with certain values, and I had a very strong understanding of my faith. So sometimes, you know, people question if they don't really understand their own faith very well. But um, I think it's always like good. Like I always always question it and maybe ask questions and make myself think and do more research. Um, just because, you know, I don't want to just accept things as is. Sometimes it's good to do your own research and prove it to yourself. And so I've done those types of things, but I've never had any, you know, major issues, but that's definitely a problem. If someone hasn't grown up with the same, like, strong sense of faith and, you know, they go out into the world or college, that can definitely become an issue, which I've witnessed with a lot of other people. And that's another reason why I wanted to join Muslim Student Association is because I think it's important when people get to college to have some sort of connection to their faith, so. And then have you um, ever been involved in interfaith activities? Yes, yeah, so um, so growing up, again, my mom uh, had inter arranged interfaith dinners in the M Muncie community um, between like, you know, Jewish people, Christians, Muslims, Baha'i, Hindus, etc. And so, and it was just kind of like a part of like, I just part of my life. And so when I went to Purdue and I was like, hey, there's no interfaith activities here. And I was like, hmm, okay, we need to start. So um, then at Purdue, we started doing some interfaith and um, I went to a few uh, churches and spoke and we did different activities like that. I'd like to move on and talk a little bit about the um, broader Muncie community. Um, what was it like to return to Muncie after college and live here in Muncie as an adult? Um, honestly, it, sometimes it feels like I never left. Um, just because this is home and in a lot of ways things really haven't changed. It's, um, it, it, really, it really feels like I, I never left. My family's here and this has always been my sense of home and I feel like even if I went somewhere else I wouldn't truly feel at home. Uh, just the people here, and I think that's part of the nice thing about having, it's not necessarily really small, but it is kind of small community, and people are always kind to each other, which if you go to bigger cities, you don't always get that, and so um, I've definitely liked being liked being back. Now, you are, you're studying here in Muncie. Mm -hmm. Do you think that once your studies are over that you will stay? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so it really just depends with uh, going to medical school. It just really depends where you get your residency. You don't get much choice with that. But um, I really do see myself probably staying in Indiana and staying close to my parents. So whether that's being in Muncie or being a few hours away, that's probably where I want to be. And then do you have extended family here in Muncie? Yes. So um, I have, there's probably about 30 plus of us, if you include my family, my extended family. I have an aunt and two uncles and all of their families are here within like five minutes of me. So um, it's fun, it's good. <laughs> and then have you developed friendships with um, non-Muslims in Muncie? Yeah, so, um, well, I, I still ha had a lot of my friends from high school, but then also uh, um, being in this new school and new, pe new faces, I've, you know, obviously made friendships with all of them. Um, it's a little more difficult to find friendships outside of my school because medical school will take over your life. But um, I have really never had an issue making friends. And I always, um, like I said, I always like to meet new people and because I think we can learn so much from each other. So I always make an attempt to build those friendships whenever I can. Do you talk about your practice of Islam with those friends? I do. Um, so, Sometimes I'll get questions and then that will, and then I may like answer, but then I'll answer more than I need to, just because sometimes people are hesitant to ask questions. So I know they may be curious, um, but I don't do it like in a very obvious way, but even just because I have to pray when I'm at school. So people will see me take out my prayer rug and then that, that will trigger questions or, um, actually, to be honest, I've actually been talking about a lot because even wearing a stethoscope with my hijab has been kind of a challenge. So then that will bring up more conversation about that. 
And uh, we, all, we talk a lot in medical school about um, the intersection of faith and medicine. And, you know, so um, inadvertently, I have ended up, you know, I feel like I've taught a lot to my, my classmates a lot about Islam and the way I practice it and how a Muslim patient may, you know, want to be treated and stuff like that. And then, um, do you, you live in um, your parents' house in Muncie? Yes, I do. Um, do you ever speak to your neighbors then in, in your community there? Yes, um, uh, we're very close to our neighbors. Um, so one of them actually I went to high school with, so, uh, and his parents, and we usually will, we, my mom's part of the neighborhood like board and so we usually go to neighborhood functions, but then also like if we make extra cookies or vice versa, we'll just walk over to our neighbor's house and um, give and there's usually an exchange going on. And so we're, I would say we're fairly close to them. We've always really enjoyed our neighbors. Has that been another opportunity where you perhaps have been able to share your faith with them? Um, yeah, so I think um, definitely when, you, when, you meeting, when you're meeting new people, I think they're always curious to learn too, and if you establish a relationship with them, they feel more comfortable to ask questions. And so I think all that thing, all that happens really naturally. It's not really, um, you know, it's not like you're going over there with the purpose of doing that. But as you get to know each other, you want to learn more about each other, and it, it happens naturally. So I think, and that's one um, thing that Islam focuses a lot of, on is that you know taking care of your neighbors and treating your neighbors well. And uh, so you know that's one reason why you know if you make an effort to cook for them or do something for them or help them out when they need, that's really important. But then you also build those friendships and then you also learn from each other in the process. And now we talked a little bit about um, you being involved with your mother's organization, Awaken. Mm -hmm. um, but have you been engaged in any other community organizations or activities here in, in Muncie? Um, so since I've been back, um, so w something I'm actually working on which it's still in the process, but what we are trying to do is um, open up some kind of form of a student-run clinic because um, Muncie's community's healthcare is pretty bad, but we actually have a lot of primary care physicians. So something that we wanna do is connect people in Muncie to primary care physicians. Um, so really, it's, it's not even, uh, really something benefiting medical students as much, but we're just trying to connect people to um, resources and so this is like a, a big project that I'm in the midst of working on so it's not a formal organization yet but we're working on it. And then would you say that um, in working to implement these kind of um, organizations uh, does that contribute to a sense of belonging to Mo in Muncie? Yeah I feel like if you're living somewhere if you're not involved I feel like you're not really living there like I strongly believe in like if you're living somewhere you need to make the most out of it and you need to also help the community that you're living in um and like if, when i meet people that aren't involved in anything i'm like well why not because if you're living somewhere i think you should make it the best situation for you but also for others um and i think that's what it really means to be part of a community it's not just having a residence somewhere that doesn't really mean much so i feel like if i'm not doing these things that i'm not doing my job or, you know, I'm not doing, I'm not living in Muncie the right way. So I think that's definitely a, a big factor for me. And now, I mean, we've spoken a lot about the Muncie Islamic Center and, and the sense of unity there, but um, on that same note of belonging, would you say that the Islamic Center here has also given you a sense of belonging within Muncie? Yeah, definitely. Um, again, like, I feel like I feel completely comfortable there. It's like, it's like a second home to me. So um, so I can just go there and I can, even if I'm not going there to pray or for a certain event, I can just even just go there to relax, which is, you know, just nice to be in a peaceful place. And, uh, I definitely feel a sense of belonging. Like it's a second home to me. And then now you are at the Ball Memorial Hospital and that's obviously connected to Ball State. Mm -hmm. Um, how has the presence of Ball State in the community been a factor in your life? Um, I think that um, a great thing about Ball State is that it's brought a lot of diversity to our community, um, and w which is great. And then also a lot of uh, a lot of events because of because Ball State is here, we've been able to collaborate a lot more than we would have if there weren't a lot, if there weren't students here. 
So I think that combination of um, getting a more diverse community and different perspectives, but also being able to do more outreach and more collaboration has been really beneficial um, to Muncie as a whole. And then how recently have you returned to your family's home country of Afghanistan? Do you have family there? Um, I do have a lot of family there. Um, I would say, you know, between like almost probably 100 cousins there. I honestly could not keep count or tell you all of their names. And I haven't been since I was eight years old. And the reason for that is because it's just, it's still not very safe. And I was actually just talking to my mom the other day because I really want to go to see all the services that we've implemented through the nonprofit. But unfortunately, it's just not very safe to go. Um, but when I was eight, I did go. And I, I remember it very vividly just because it was so drastically different from my life here. And those memories will always impact the way that I think about um, the world, for sure. So even though I only had that one experience, I was there for three months, and even though I was really young, I think because it was so different, those things stick with me. Now, I know that there are some um, practices within Islam which require the, the burial of people um, in their home countries um, in a very quick amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, how important do you feel that your, your parents, who come from Afghanistan, are buried back there? Um, so there's no requirement of being buried in your home country, but some people definitely prefer it. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, my grandmother, um, she passed away. Because, yeah, we do have to bury within a very short amount of time. I think it's by the next day, by sunset. I'm not sure by the technicalities. But my grandmother, um, because she hadn't spent most of her life here, this was not, she did not consider the U.S. her home. She wanted to be buried in Afghanistan. And so my parents took the body fairly quickly to Afghanistan. Just they were able to get a flight and bury her there. But um, my parents, because they've lived here for so long, over 30 years, and my mom, for her, she's lived here for more than half of, or for most, the majority of her life has been spent here. So they really consider this home. So I think they're perfectly fine with being buried here, actually. Um, so I think it's really just a sense of where you, where your sense of home is. For my grandmother, that was still in Afghanistan. For my parents, that's here now. Obviously, they have a lot of ties to Afghanistan, but this is their home now. So I think that's what the difference is. So I want to move a little bit and talk about um, kind of uh, events within the nation, America, and, and the world. Um, so you were you were six when 9-11 occurred. Yes. Um, what do you remember about the events of that time? Um, so I just remember being at school and um, we like, everyone was freaking out and we kind of had to stay after school and I had no idea what was going on. And um, even when I went home, I mean, I think at you know six years old, you even if your parents try to explain something to you, you're really not going to understand it. And I felt like I really only saw implications of it, like maybe like a few months or I don't, I can't remember specifically how much later when people started asking me. <laughs> a couple people asked me if I was related to Osama bin Laden. Um, I remember I was at a playground once, and this kid came up to me and asked me that, and then I was just like, you know. No, and I didn't know how to respond. And that's the first time I realized kind of the implications of it. So 9-11 um, changed the lives of some Muslim community members here in America. Um, can you speak a little bit more about how it might have changed you or your families? Yeah, so um, because I was so young, I wasn't you know, very aware of all the implications. Like I said, all I really remember was those few questions that I got and some people teasing me about it. but. Uh, something I learned later was that my mom and sister, because they were wearing hijab at the time, was that my dad, you know, he was really nervous about it and he was telling them, you know, you guys should take it off because if, you know, we, there's no need to be targeted. Um, and that's something that a lot of people across America were doing is a lot of people that, you know, were more visibly Muslim were making changes, whether that was taking off hijab or whatever they were doing, um, so that they wouldn't be targeted because there was an increase in, you know, hate crimes, obviously, after that. And, um, you know, my mom and sister have a very strong sense of faith, and they, you know, they're like, they they chose, they're like, no, we want to keep wearing this. Um, this is something that we're doing for God, and it's not for anyone else. And so if something happens, it happens. So not everyone will make that decision. But I just, I do remember that my dad was telling me that he was trying to encourage them. Like, I mean, obviously he was very nervous for them. And so he's like, you know, you don't have to wear it. You, It's perfectly fine to take it off. But they, they made the decision to keep wearing it. But just the fact that they had to talk about that, 
um, obviously is upsetting. Um, it was just a very traumatic time, I think, for everyone. So, Do you remember in any way in which the greater um, Lindsay community, the, the Islamic community here, reacted? Um, I don't remember the specifics. Like I said, I was really young, but my dad told me that he started um, reaching out to people in leadership and state senators, et cetera, um, to kind of, you know, counteract some of the propaganda that was being made and to make those connections. So, um, like I said, I don't remember specifically, but I know that some of those things were done. So your father, he pursued new forms of participation, perhaps in, in government, local and- Yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm. And then did your mother also have kind of a, a personal response to like how she could participate more after 9-11? Yeah. Um, I don't have any specific examples, but I, I assume that they were probably on the same page and doing um, more outreach together, but I wouldn't know the specifics about that. So there have been um, quite a few events since 9-11 that have affected the world and, and America and the Muslim community. Um, have any directly affected you or if you had um, a big uh, participation in speaking about them, such as like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, are you saying have I spoken about them or? Yeah, or like, or what ways have they affected you? Um, so a lot of times the media um, shows a very one-sided view of that conflict, or even just of Muslims in general, and sometimes it can be a distorted or um, it's just a lot of times it's propaganda just about who's controlling the media, who's you know, funding and the U.S. and stuff like that. And so I think it is very difficult for me to see sometimes, you know, these misconstrued or one-sided views in the media. Um, and obviously, if people see that in the media and they're not taught otherwise, they're going to believe it. So um, it's definitely upsetting, but then also I, I try my best to, you know, show that there is another side and that, you know, just different ways that I can dispel some of those misconceptions. Earlier, we spoke on the fact that um, you know there is a very historic African American presence in the Muslim community here in the U.S. Um, have you thought about the importance of the Black Lives Matter movement within kind of the Muslim or the the Islamic community here in America? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I don't know about specifically in the context of African American Muslims in this community, but. I believe like strongly in in the movement of Black Lives Matter, just because, um, and I think you can see it in Muncie in general, is that there's there's some institutionalized racism and um, there's still still a lot of issues that um, black people are still having to go through. And so I think that a Black Lives Matter movement is something that um, Islamically even that I believe in because, you know, everyone sh everyone's, life has equal value. No one's life is worth more or less than another. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I strongly believe in it. I don't know if there's been any particular actions taking place in Muncie. I know there was some at Purdue, while I was at Purdue, well, that's when a lot of the things were going on and I participated in some of those um, protests and, and things, but I wouldn't know, I don't know anything specific about the Muncie community. And now another very recent event has been the 2016 presidential election. Now, you were a student during that time. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of your memories of how that time was? Yeah. Um, so just during the election period, uh, a lot of it was just like being in disbelief. I was like, there's no way that this is happening. Like I was just, you know, kind of in disbelief. But then as it started becoming more serious and I realized that um, Trump was becoming a more serious candidate and people were actually buying into the propaganda I was like, oh, we should do something about this because people really don't know much about Muslims. And so many people, ha so many of the people that, you know, are buying into this propaganda have never met a Muslim. And so that's when, um, and I was at Purdue, like I said, and that's when I was like, we need to do something about this. And we need to um, do more events with our community, more outreach so that we can educate others and kind of disp dispel some of these misconceptions because there were so many floating around at that time. So I think that you know, after that disbelief kind of wore off and I realized it was serious, um, I kind of encouraged the Muslim Student Association, we all kind of worked together to start doing more outreach events, more events to educate others, just like we had like panels 
where people could just openly ask questions. Like we tried so many different methods because, you know, we were just doing whatever we could to dispel all the propaganda that was in the media. I assume perhaps that was maybe a bit tiring or, or, or draining to constantly have to, um, you know, present yourself and, and speak to others about. Yeah, it was honestly. Um, just the fact that, I mean, first of all, just the fact that people were believing and buying into all the propaganda and that, you know, people really hated Muslims. Like, you know, I, and that was just emotionally upsetting in itself. And then on top of that, you're upset and then you have to work double hard to discompel those misconceptions. So um, it was definitely exhausting in a sense because, uh, you know, I was always aware, like I was like hyper aware of myself and I'm like, how am I, do I look okay? Like, do I look normal? Are people gonna think something about me? Um, and always trying to like, always be as polite as possible. Um, and a lot of uh, my Muslim friends and I have talked about this, how we can't have a bad day in the sense that like, let's say I go to a coffee shop and like I am having a horrible day and I'm like a little bit rude or whatever to um, whoever's serving me, which I mean, obviously you should never do that, but sometimes it may happen if you're having a bad day, but you really can't do that because sometimes that one interaction that you have, if it's a negative one, and you know, you're visibly Muslim like I am, they'll be like, oh, you know, those Muslims, and they'll generalize you. And I don't necessarily blame people for that because if I am the only interaction they've had, but in the other sense, I'm like, okay, that means I need to make sure that like, I'm always, you know, like being overly nice or, you know, making the extra effort um, to make sure that it doesn't happen, which, um, yeah, it could be tiring at times, but I think it was definitely necessary because of um, so much that was going on. On that note, um, some Muslim citizens have noticed, um, have noted that in the wake of terror attacks, um, such as you know, 9-11 or uh, in Paris, mm -hmm. um, it can be difficult for Muslims to express grief um, and sorrow for these, these happenings when at the same time they're looked at with suspicion. Um, would you say that resonates with your experience? Yeah, I mean, every time, I hear of another attack. I mean, obviously I'm devastated just as everyone else is. And then on the other sense, I'm also worried like, okay, you know, are they Muslim? What are, What's gonna happen now? Because if they were technically by name Muslim or if their name sounded a little Muslim or whatever the situation may have been, we're gonna get blamed as a whole for it. And so like, and it's unfortunate that we have to think that way, but it happens naturally. I mean, if I hear something, I'm like, oh man, like that's awful. And then I'm also like, oh, what are the repercussions going to be now in this situation? Um, so I think that's something that, you know, we're definitely aware of. But then it also just upsets me because, you know, there are terrorist attacks that affect people, but most of the terrorist attacks are actually affecting Muslims. And that's the thing that just gets lost. I mean, most of ISIS's attacks have been against Muslims. Like we're hurting, our own countries are hurting, our, our own home countries are hurting and too. And so how could it be our fault? Why would we, you know what I mean? So it just... It didn't make as much sense, and I think that's just because some of those attacks or things got lost. Um, and so, yeah, I think it was definitely just like a lot of different feelings um, whenever one of those attacks came up. Kind of moving back towards um, speaking about something happening since the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. um, so the Muslim the travel ban um, that was implemented soon after. Um, did that affect your family or your loved ones? Um, so thankfully, um, well, Afghanistan was not included on the list, but I mean, more symbolically than anything, the fact that, you know, it actually went through and got implemented, um, I think was kind of shocking for everyone and also just very upsetting. And uh, some of my friends at Purdue, whose parents are from Iran, um, and their international students, they couldn't, they literally couldn't come. Um, and so people have faced a lot more uh, barriers and whether they just got held a little bit longer at the airport or whatever the situation was, a lot of people went through those difficulties. And even though Afghanistan wasn't on one of those lists, it was definitely a time where we're like, okay, this is not a good time to like fly out of the country just in case, because you never know, you know, you could get detained for hours or what the situation may be, because there was a lot of stories of that happening to people. Um, so obviously just like being a little bit, you know, more wary of at, at the airport and being aware that we could be 
you know, there could be issues. Thankfully, we are U.S. citizens, so the li likelihood was less, but I was definitely more concerned if my cousins or anyone was, were planning to travel anywhere because they're not U.S. citizens, and we kind of warned them, like, maybe it's not the best time right now because it was just a very uncertain time. I don't think anyone knew how that was going to pan out because it was a very new and kind of sudden thing. So I think everyone was just kind of on edge for a while. So thinking a little bit more internationally, um, let's talk a little bit about your sense of um, Islamist movements. Um, so there's, you know, it's very complex into why um, these might occur, um, such as well, ISIS or, or, or other such um, movements in which they, you know, credit Islam. Um, what do you find valuable and what do you find problematic in those agendas? So um, one thing that I think people need to understand is that a lot of these movements and organizations pop up in areas of massive destruction. And, um, you know, after, especially after all the wars um, in Iraq and Syria, that's what um, kind of made the environment favorable to radical groups popping up. Same thing in Afghanistan, um, because of all the destruction, the Taliban were able to get power. Um, in Iraq and Syria areas, there was so much destruction, desperation, the rad radical groups like ISIS can pop up. And um, a lot of things that feed into those are just desperation of the people. They've lost so much, you know, the family members. And um, usually the people that will join, well, in one sense, some, a lot of people are threatened into joining. Their family members may die if they don't join or, um, you know, or they have, they have no food and no home. And so ISIS or whatever the organization will be will promise them warm food and a place to live. And that's like so much that they could ask for. So they will join. So it feeds on a lot of the desperation and destruction that's happened. And uh, having the agenda of, you know, making it a, a religiously quote unquote motivated thing is it's a great way to get people on board. That's essentially what it is, especially because, because so many people are uneducated about their religion. If they think they know they're Muslim or whatever, and they, they may believe it just because they don't know what they don't know any better. And I think the people at the center of those organizations know better, but you know, a lot of times it's, they may say it's for Islam, but it's really political agenda. They want power, they want money, just like most of the forces in the world um, are driven for power and money. And um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of unfortunate things that come with these radical movements. Um, and a lot of times people need to realize that they're not really following um, Islam. They're following their own political agenda and they're feeding off of um, unfortunate situations. So focusing, refocusing perhaps back more in America, um, what are your perceptions of the U.S. in 2018 as a young American resident? Uh, I've, I've always been proud to be in the U.S. just because, you know, there's no other country where, you know, you can be so free to practice religion and say and freedom of speech and all, and all of those aspects. Um, I mean, there's not many countries where I can just criticize the president openly, um, as I may sometimes do. And, but, I mean, it has upset, it upset me greatly since um, Trump got elected, just because it made me realize that there's so much more division and hate in the U.S. than I ever thought there was. And, um, and I'm not saying it's all that way, but there is a lot more than, than I realized. And so that's something that has um, really upset me, and especially on election night. I, I just remember, like, you know, tears were just rolling down my face when I started realizing that, like, there's people that actually believe this, like, that they, you know, they really hate people like me or um, um, they really want to build the wall and all those things. And so, um, I you know, it kind of makes you lose a little bit of faith, but I still know that there's good people and there's good people fighting, um, fighting against, you know, a lot of this hatred and racism. And so I always choose to focus on that part of the U.S., which I, is very strong. And so, um, you know, there was some wavering, but, you know, I'm still very, uh, you know, proud to be in the U.S. and I'm hoping that there will be changes for the better soon. So now we talked a little bit about civil rights movements such as the Black Lives Matter movement, um, but in terms of other civil rights, um, how personal of an issue is, is fighting for those things for you? Um, are you, do you mean like civil rights in general or, or like Muslim rights or just in general? Both. Both. 
Um, so like I said, you know, a really strong component of Islam is social justice and something that also I said gets lost. And um, there are so many verses and hadiths that say you, you need to stand up. If something wrong is being done, you need to stand up. Like apathy is not acceptable. Um, being a bystander is really not acceptable. And that's something that I strongly believe in myself. And so if I see any inequalities like, the, like within the Black Lives Matter movement um, or in, in any other situation, like I feel like it's my responsibility to speak to that and um, to make people aware of it and then also improve the situation if I'm, if I'm able. So for me, those all affect me very personally. Um, and I sometimes can get emotional because of those issues because you know, if any human is hurting, I'm hurting. And that's how I feel, whether they're Muslim, whether they're, you know, atheist, whether they're black, white, whatever the situation may be. Um, you know, if, if anyone is hurting, that's, that's, it becomes personal for me too. And so um, I think that's kind of what fuels my activism. Now, we talked a lot about how you have multiple identities, such as, you know, your, um, parents being from Afghanistan, being Muslim, being women. Um, but in terms of debated terms of self-identification, does American Muslim characterize your self-understanding? Um, I would say yes. Um, definitely um, because, you know, I'm, I, I'm American. I was born here for sure. But I also feel like being a Muslim is such a strong part of my identity that, you know, it really, they deserve to go together because I, I'm an American Muslim. Like, I think that that really does match my identity. Um, even though other people may think that those conflict with each other, but I think that they work perfectly together and that, um, yeah, I would say that definitely does. And what, what are your hopes for the future? Um, my hopes is just that people we come to understand each other more and learn about each other. And that, you know, and I think this is already happening, you know, is that people will make an effort to get to know each other and then that will get rid of hopefully some of the hatred and misunderstandings that have been happening. Because for the most part, and it may not be true in every circumstance, I feel like a lot of the times when we, when there's disagreement or dislike, it's because someone hasn't interacted with that those type of people or that other person before. And I think that if we increase those interactions, it's going to um, d get rid of a lot of that hatred or negativity. And so, uh, I mean, my, my goal for the future is hopefully that there will be increased understanding and also that people will fight the inequalities that are persisting in the US um, and that hopefully there will be a change. Now in closing, I want you to take you know, as much time as you want to, you can give an answer for this, but if you could recall one story or event from your life that captures what it means to you to be Muslim in America, what would it be? Um, well, I don't know if I can think of a specific story, but I believe that, um, I mean, even just after, during Trump's election and after the election, like the people, what it means to be Muslim in America is not only practicing your own faith, but it also means that we have to remain united and that we have to um, do our part to educate others. And so there are people that, you know, after the election, they may, you know, kind of shy away from the community and things like that, or you know, they may just you know try to be invisible and blend in. And for me, being an American Muslim means you no. Know, that's the time that you get more involved, you get more integrated, and you uh, you work more to get to know other people and educate them. And what and and also, Amer being an American Muslim means that if there's a some type of injustice coming up that happens, you speak out against it. You don't just you know. Um, be apathetic about it. So, you know, in the Black Lives Matter movement or any other movement such, a, such as those, if something happens, you should speak out against it and you shouldn't just stay quiet and let it pass by. And so um, I think those moments that I've experienced, that, that is to me what the kind of essence of being an American Muslim is.
Well, thank you, Asma. On behalf of the Virginia Duval Center Seminar, Muslims and Muncie, I want to thank you for sharing your story today. Thank you.